SABC, together with the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development, bring you the final verdict. In the pursuit of justice, we are all equal before the law. These are some of the stories that have led to the final verdict. In 2010 alone, nearly 2,000 South African doctors faced claims of medical negligence, and each year, the number of investigations increases. When medical professionals fail to uphold their legal duty of care, it can have disastrous consequences. There may not be enough doctors in South Africa for the size of its population, but when innocent lives are lost as a direct result of negligence, someone has to face the consequences. The Hippocratic Oath is an undertaking which uh, every medical practitioner who qualifies or graduates undertakes so that it may do no harm. Anybody who comes into your hands wants to leave your, you living feeling better, obviously. Science is not perfect. I think we're dealing with a number of specific um, disciplines that you find more acknowledged complications or further negligence that can occur. I would say uh, most probably in the general surgical field, gynecological field and orthopedic field. But you do find that complications occur in the other, uh, in the other di disciplines as well. Tina Makoba was admitted to hospital for a hysterectomy, a routine procedure. Her husband, Dr. Makoba, came to visit her shortly after surgery. Hi, Dali. I'm <laughs> going <laughs> Okay. Come on. What's Come going on? on? Her BP has dropped and she's not breathing. Would you just she let was me? She fine. And now look, what the hell is going on here? Please just let me. Please escort Dr. McCorber to the waiting room. I need 20 cc's of adrenaline and the defib. Normally, there are about maybe 16,000 cases that are reported. But we find that upon sifting them, 1,600 are found to be worthy of going to a hearing. After that, you find that there are maybe 160 convictions. So the convictions are quite low, just about 10%. Even though the surgery had no complications, Tina Makoba died shortly after, and the reasons were shrouded in mystery. Come in. I'm so sorry to disturb you, Doctor. Sir, I was one of your wife's nurses. I was there when... Dr. Makoba, I believe your wife could have been saved. I was there. I saw her. I told the doctor that... Nurse Taylor, I know you mean well. My family and I have been through so much this week. I know. And I'm so, so sorry for your loss. But Tina should not have died. I was there. I tried everything that I could. No, no, that's not what I mean. I called Tina's surgeon about an hour before you even came to visit. I was worried about your wife's vitals, so I phoned the doctor to tell her, but she didn't listen to me. If the surgeon had come in to see Tina when I called, your wife could have been saved. You are telling me that Dr. Carvender knew the state my wife was in? And she did nothing. You have to go. Yes, of course. 
negligence can actually be as a result of an act or it can actually also be as a result of a failure to act. The test for negligence is premised on the principle that a person fails to act whereas he foresees that the failure to act may result in an injury or damage to another person. On the one side, it's really to foresee that possibility, um, where a doctor has a, a liability on his side, and to foresee with his knowledge and skill whether that end result could have occurred, and to prevent it and or limit it. Coming up, Dr. Govinda's negligence lands her in court on a criminal charge. She gave me no reason to be concerned. In cases where medical negligence results in the death of a patient, the state brings a criminal charge against the doctor in question. A private individual may also institute a civil case to sue the doctor for damages. We usually deal with highly traumatized people. Whether there's indeed a case is a different scenario. And as you've said, it's a clinical determination and process really. Would the reasonable doctor have done something differently? We refer to that as protocol, professional procedure, to say that I usually use the example and say if eight out of 10 doctors in the same discipline with the same clinical information would have treated or acted differently, then the doctor might be liable. One of Ms. van der Valt's clients is currently suing a hospital for injuries she suffered as a result of medical negligence. I went to the hospital for a pain in my back. It made my leg numb because I couldn't walk. That's why I went to hospital. And um, they were supposed, that were, that's why they're there, to look after me. And I came back home with broken shoulders and still not fixed back. Nobody can tell me what happened that day. My husband told me that he came in the ward where I uh, uh, laid down on the bed. And as he came in, I was busy having something. He doesn't know what it was. I guess it was a fit, I'm not sure. He says I was sitting up and throwing my arms in the air. And I can't remember that really. But that's where he got in and he saw everything and there was nobody in the ward with me. And um, I almost fell down from the bed and he tried to help me. And then he went out and shouted, doctor, doctor, please help. And there was nobody. For more than 15 to 20 minutes, he was shouting and nobody came to him. I'm in a lot of pain some days. I need my husband to help me put on my clothes. I had to change my clothes in lots of ways because I can't put up my arms anymore to put on my clothes. And I really need someone there for me sometimes to put on stuff. It was difficult. It was really not nice. Her case is currently pending. If you believe you have a civil claim for medical negligence but cannot afford legal representation, you can approach a legal practitioner and ask him or her to represent you on the basis of a contingency fees agreement. In terms of the Contingency Fees Act, a legal practitioner may enter into an agreement with a client if, in his or her opinion, there are reasonable prospects that the client may be successful. The agreement must state that the practitioner shall not be entitled to any fees unless such client is successful to the extent agreed upon. In cases of uh, uh, medical negligence or any other negligence for that matter, it's not really um, the only issue that the members of the public can wait upon the finalization of the criminal trial. They can proceed to sue the person for damages, whatever they have lost as a result of the death or injury of the other person. And uh, in our country, the biggest problem is the cost of litigation. Um, in this instance, a person can approach uh, various law societies um, firstly, in terms of the pro bono services that the various law societies um, are currently engaged in, or they can approach a lawyer on contingency fee basis where the lawyer can make an assessment of how good the merits are and with an understanding that 
the particular lawyer will be paid at the end of the case when the case has been done successfully. The state charged Dr. Govender with culpable homicide, alleging that Mrs. Markova died as a direct result of Dr. Govender's negligent failure to attend to her after surgery. Mrs. Taylor, what do you tell Dr. Govender when you find her? I told her that the patient was unstable. I then read out her blood pressure and pulse rate readings. And what was Dr. Govender's response? She reprimanded me for phoning her and said she was busy. And then she told me that I should treat the patient by increasing her fluid intake and that I should have known that. How sure are you that you gave the accused the vitals? I'm very sure. That was the reason I called her in the first place. Mrs. Taylor, how often do you call Dr. Govender whilst on duty? Very seldom. Doctors tend to get irritated when nurses call them, so I only call when there's something I'm extremely concerned about. Given your medical experience with such matters, how high would you say the deceased chances of survival was if she had been seen to after you called the doctor? Her doctor would have been far more qualified to deal with any problems that arose, so I would say that the deceased chance of survival would have been high, very high. No further questions, my lord. Mrs. Taylor, when you phoned Dr. Govender, did you request that she come in and see the patient? No. I thought she was in the best position to make that kind of call herself. So you didn't tell her you thought this was a life or death situation? No. Why not? As the patient's doctor, she would have been able to tell whether it was a life or death situation from the vitals that I read out. It's not my job to make deductions for the doctors. I see. And was anyone standing near you when you allegedly read out these vitals? I don't remember. So you have no one to confirm what you're saying? That's not what I... Not a single person. Please, may, may I finish? By all means. Firstly, I did not say I have no one to corroborate that I read out her vitals. I said that I don't remember if anyone heard me. Secondly, I would have no reason to call a doctor if not to read out the patient's worrisome vitals, the state of which can be corroborated by the patient's medical records. Well, the, the, the important ethical guidelines are simply that you, as a doctor, you have to d d do your best in making sure that whatever the outcome, you have done what you were supposed to, what, what you were expected to do. For example, when you examine it, you may not neglect to take the vitals and wear somebody, you would have discovered somebody has got diabetes had you taken a blood glucose, for example, but you don't as a doctor and the patient goes into a coma and die, that that you may not neglect. So the standard training applies and nobody therefore may die as a result of you're not doing what you are supposed to do. Dr. Governor, what did Nurse Taylor tell you when she phoned? She said that the patient's blood pressure was low. And what did you tell her to do? Well, it sounded like the patient was slightly hypervolemic, so I told the nurse to increase her fluid intake. Mm -hmm. And what readings did she give you? None. She merely informed me that the patient's blood pressure had dropped. I see. Now, without the benefit of hindsight, would you say that if you were faced with the same set of circumstances, would you go to the hospital and check on the patient? I don't think I would react any differently. No further questions, my lord. Dr. Governor, did you ask Nurse Taylor what the deceased's vital signs were? No, I didn't. Why not? She gave me no reason to be concerned. Doctor, before this, has a nurse ever called a doctor if there wasn't something of vital importance or concern? No, I can't say that they have. So surely the fact that Nurse Taylor called must have indicated that she was concerned. Well, yes, I, I suppose so. Then if you know that nurses only call doctors if it's something important, why didn't you ask her for the blood pressure readings? I don't know. I just didn't. You just didn't? You told Nurse Taylor that you were busy when she phoned you. What were you doing?
Please answer the question, Dr. Govender. I was at lunch. In a case where a doctor is called and they are supposed to intervene and they don't appear, first we have to establish whether there were any other circumstances that justify his, justified his inability to arrive. For example, a doctor was driving and suddenly had a tire puncture and couldn't drive. But, but should it be found that the doctor was around but was reluctant to see the patient and the patient died, it can as well be assumed that the, the doctor was negligent in that he could have intervened, even if that patient could still have died. If he have intervened, you are, more, you are less guilty than you would you, you become if you refuse to go and see the patient. Coming up, will the state prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Dr. Govender's negligence caused Mrs. Makoba's death? This honorable court should accordingly find her guilty on the charge of culpable homicide. Culpable homicide is the unlawful and negligent killing of another human being. The legal requirements for a conviction are that the death must have been reasonably foreseeable, a reasonable person would have taken steps to guard against the death, and the accused must have failed to take such steps. The difference between murder and culpable homicide in our law is simple that there must be a state of mind um, which is a criminal state of mind. That means there must be an intention to kill for the act to constitute a murder. Whereas when you talk about culpable homicide, it's actually a death by accident, where when a person didn't intend to kill that person, but there's a result of that accidental act, the person dies. Even with culpable homicide, um, the person must do an act which is preventable, which result in the death. Whereas in the murder situation, the intention originally must have been to kill. For instance, in a case of a fight, um, one might just be fighting the other person simple with, the, with an idea to ward that person off and the, the person might die. And also you can think of a situation where a policeman um, shoots a person with an intention to apprehend that person and ends up killing that person. So the court has to make a determination whether um, there was there an intention to kill or a culpable homicide. It can be either both. In closing, my Lord, the expert testimony presented to this court by various medical experts all leads to one unavoidable conclusion. Mrs. Makoba would not have met her untimely death on the date specified had it not been for the negligent omission of the accused who failed to attend to a patient after she was alerted to the dire condition that she was in. I submit that the accused is both factually and legally liable for the death of Mrs. Makoba, and that this honorable court should accordingly find her guilty on the charge of culpable homicide. My Lord, I humbly remind this court that not all the expert medical evidence presented during the course of this trial has been consistent. Some medical experts have testified that the death of the deceased could have been prevented if Dr. Govender had attended to her immediately. But in contrast, others have testified that Mrs. Makoba had reached the point of no return by the time Dr. Govender had been phoned. Even if the nurse had successfully conveyed the urgency of the situation to Dr. Govender, there is a very real likelihood that there is nothing Dr. Govender could have done to stop the inevitable. That the state has not discharged the burden upon it. To prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Dr. Govender is legally and factually liable for the death of the deceased. Mrs. Makoba's death was a tragedy. But we must not be distracted from the very real likelihood that that death was the result of an adverse reaction to the surgery. A reaction 
that the accused could not have foreseen and not prevented. The test for a reasonable person is that one, will the reasonable person in the position of the accused or respondent in a civil case have foreseen that his act will result in damage? Having foreseen that, does that person take any active step to avoid um, that damage? And if the person fails to take that active step, which result in the damage, the person then becomes liable for negligence. The evidence presented to this court by medical experts and eyewitness testimony shows overwhelmingly that if the accused had attended to the deceased soon after Mrs. Taylor had phoned, her life would have been saved. But for the negligence of the accused, the deceased would be alive today. Dr. Govender went to lunch, knowing that her patient was in a critical condition. I believe that any other reasonable doctor in the position of the accused would immediately have attended to his or her patient and thus saved the patient's life. Ms. Taylor strikes me as a reliable and truthful witness. Even if she did not tell the accused the patient's vitals, the responsibility would have still fallen on the accused to ask for them. In my view, the state has successfully established the necessary causal link between the negligence of the accused and the death of the deceased. In respect of the charge of culpable homicide of Tina Makoba, you, Dr. Governor, are found guilty. Court is adjourned until next Monday at 10 a.m. when sentencing proceedings will begin. In this case, there are a few elements that the court had to look at um, in finding Dr. Govinda as um, guilty of culpable homicide. Firstly, she had a responsibility to act and she failed to act in terms of that responsibility. When she received the call from the nurse, she was obliged to respond positively and the failure to respond positively resulted in the death of the patient. And it is on those basis that the court found her um, guilty of culpable homicide. Medical negligence can give rise to either a civil trial, a criminal trial, or both. In a civil trial, the plaintiff sues the defendant for the damages the plaintiff suffered as a result of the defendant's negligent act or failure to act. In a criminal trial, the state must prove beyond reasonable doubt that the negligence of the accused caused an unlawful consequence and the accused is then found criminally liable. For an accused to be found guilty of murder, the state must prove that he or she had intention to kill. For an accused to be found guilty of culpable homicide, the state must prove that he or she was negligent and that the negligence was the cause of the death. Negligence may take the form of either an act or a failure to act. The final verdict was brought to you by SABC together with the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development.